Good afternoon. Welcome to our humanities debate. Thank you all for coming to this extraordinary session of Parliament of the Faculty of Humanities. As you know, there are pressing matters of state which have forced the House to sit today. I am the Speaker of the House, and allow me to remind you that I am to be addressed as Mr. Speaker, and that all comments in the House are to be addressed to me. We do expect decorum to be followed. There should be no discharging of firearms, no photographing of babies. And should violations occur, I will not hesitate to use the full range of discipline at my disposal. I'm delighted to see such a good turnout today. There was some confusion, I know, about the place of today's parliamentary meeting, and luckily our automated call system seems to have worked. <laughs> and uh, the calls that you received last night made sure that everyone was in the right place at the right time. Let me outline our order of business today. We're called here to debate the resolution of the government, be it resolved that the book is dead. The Prime Minister will begin by speaking for five minutes. The first opposition member will speak for five minutes. The first government member will then speak for five minutes. And the leader of the opposition will then speak for seven minutes. Finally, the Prime Minister will give a rebuttal speech of two minutes. After the speeches of the government and the opposition, there will be an opportunity for statements from the floor. You are the floor. <laughs> These statements must be brief, on topic, and addressed to the speaker. Your statement should make it clear whether you're speaking for or against the resolution. After there has been sufficient opportunity for floor speeches, I will bring the debate to a close and call the vote. Victory will be determined by a showing of hands and a simple majority will determine whether the resolution passes or not. On a technical note, I will remind you in that this debate is being recorded. There is a microphone that I will be trotting around to have you hold and use when you make your statements from the floor. By therefore making a statement from the floor with the microphone, you are implicitly agreeing to be recorded uh, in this event, and we thank you for that. Let me begin then by introducing the members of Parliament. Prime Minister Cameron, Right Honourable Member from Philosophy, would you stand? The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sayers, the Honourable Member from English. The First Government Member, McGuinness, the Honourable Member from Linguistics. And the First Opposition Member, Tucker, the Honourable Member from English. Are there any questions either from the members or from the floor, from the gallery. Yes? Mr. Speaker, may we hoot and holler? <laughs> I would remind you that proper parliamentary decorum is to be uh, followed, and you may hear calls for order, or shrill cries for peace, or the sergeant at arms may be invoked, but I leave it to your best judgment how you view this as behavior. <laughs> Any other comments? Well then, Madam Prime Minister, you have the floor. I'm just going to get my timing device here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Books, hard or soft bound objects containing printed text that can be carried around. These are complex cultural artifacts that are deeply entwined with our cultural institutions and they're bound up in our various systems of value. I confess to having been a very serious book snob for most of my life. When I would go into another person's house for dinner, I'd surreptitiously look around, see how many books they had, see what books they had, and then I'd judge. 
If they had children in the house and they didn't have books, I would judge very harshly. But what was that giving me? It was giving me the appearance of learnedness, the appearance of culture. And I realized it's just that. It's just an appearance. You can hire an interior decorator to produce the same effect. We're here to declare that the book is dead. Now, this worry has been expressed many times in the past with the introduction of the phonograph, the introduction of moving pictures, and especially in the 50s, the introduction of the television. But this fear was different. This was a fear that people would stop reading and writing. But quite the opposite has happened. And the death of the book will only increase opportunities for reading and writing. We are hailing the death of the Gutenberg book. We might think of, as one professor has helpfully suggested, the period since the invention of the printing press, these past 500 years as being a parenthesis, a Gutenberg parenthesis. What is this? A 500-year interruption of oral culture. Print dominance is, in fact, a short-lived portion of our culture's history precisely because it's so limiting. The Gutenberg book limited and, in some places, replaced two extraordinarily important human activities, memorization and dialogue. Now, we might worry that electronic media may move us further away from reliance on memory. That's probably something you can Google. But e-media has the capacity to shift us from the passivity, the isolation, the depersonalization of book culture back to a lively culture of personal interaction and dialogue. The new book has properties that can't be found in any Gutenberg format. We can present videos of objects, videos of events, live chat rooms, ongoing revision, and widely interactive authorship. More importantly, post-Gutenberg books banish the notion that being static, which is somehow equated with being eternally right or complete, is in some way necessary to being authoritative. This notion has led to the absurd <clears throat> excuse me, invention of an addition, an awkward compromise between the book's role as a static voice of authority and the recognition that knowledge itself is not static but continues to grow. Think of Wikipedia. This new book is being constantly updated as we learn and share more, and it makes no pretense to being the final word. The printed word bound between hard and soft covers seems to confer on its contents a greater authority than is warranted. Consider in comparison the slavish adherence to the original text and purported intentions that often distort and pervert the interpretation of important pieces of writing, such as religious texts. Imagine instead a Talmud containing hyperlinks to thousands of commentaries and interpretations historically and politically contextualized and available to everyone. The new book also banishes the dominance of the unproductive or false model of the solitary intellectual enterprise. Most important contributions, many important contributions from students and human subjects have gone completely unrecognized because of this model. And as any professor knows, many scholars have wasted what could have been productive and diversified research careers working alone to produce uh, produce books that only a small handful of people ever read, at least in most cases. Research and discovery are most effective and interesting and sometimes only possible when conducted collaboratively. And the post-Gutenberg era allows this collaborative authorship. So instead of relying on a remote expert whose words are set down in immutable print, we can have a conversation, a dialogue, even better, a debate. But this is in no way a new idea. It goes all the way back to Plato. In the Phaedrus, a dialogue written by Plato, Plato is deeply critical of the written word. And what he says applies perfectly to the Gutenberg book format. He says, you'd think the writers were speaking as if they had some understanding. But if you question Anything that's been said because you want to learn more, it continues to signify just that very same thing forever. It's absolutely thrilling to contemplate what Plato, hanging around in the Agora with Socrates while Socrates engaged young adults in profound and complex philosophical inquiry, would have done if he'd had a digital video camera. Thank you. Madam Prime Minister, we now turn to the loyal officer. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for this opportunity. The longest serving member, I think, of this parliament. Um, but that's an honorable position, I think, to be in. Is the book dead? The answer is clearly no. If it were dead, our offices would be columbaria, the library a cemetery. Neither is true. 
Indeed, I can assure you that the liveliest place in Oak Bay is the Oak Bay branch of the GBPL, short of the swimming pool. I was there on Sunday, and it was full of young families, apart from oldsters like me. Perhaps the proposition the book is dead merely overstates the less rhetorical proposition the book is dying. Here a case might be made for the proposition, but not a compelling one. To address this argument, we must define what we mean by a book. In traditional and still common usage, the book comprises a reasonably large group of bound leaves bearing text, held together between covers, capable of independent publication, the Gutenberg book in short. The reason it is not likely to die is that it is a superior technology. It is superior on the one hand to the technology that preceded it, the scroll, now obsolete. This reminds me of Marshall McLuhan, who observed that obsolete technologies become new art forms. The use of the scroll in Jewish ritual relates to this truth. Anyone who has had to work with a microfilm reader will be happy when that version of the scroll becomes an art form. (laughs) Why is it superior to the scroll? Because it is easier to produce, transport, store, and most importantly, to use. This is the reason it has hardly changed since it achieved its present form in the Middle Ages. With table of contents, chapter divisions, pagination. The medieval book, by the way, is largely responsible for the saving of the works of ancient masters, like the Phaedrus. But the modern age did improve on the medieval book, at least in some ways. Movable type enabled a vast increase in the production of books, a change, as we all know, that had incalculable uh, effects on society and culture, but at the cost of durability, for medieval inks on parchment will last and remain legible almost forever. Modern books, the ones that fill our office shelves, are also superior in crucial ways to the digital technologies that have recently begun to compete with them. The audiobook and the ebook especially if these are obtained via downloads. They require sophisticated knowledge and expensive equipment. They are elitist. Download problems were why I was in the Oak Bay Library on Sunday. I could not get the book I wanted to download. And they are hard to work with. For example, if you fall asleep listening to Kafka on the Shore on your iPod Nano, the disembodied voice of the reader will not politely pause until you awake. (laughs) And you will be hard-pressed to find your way back to the place at which your waking self exited that book. I say this from experience. If you've read Kafka on the Shore, you'll understand. Audiobooks do, I admit, answer the special needs of some. My father-in-law had his cassette player after he went blind. Uh, My ecological daughter makes sense of her determination to trudge to work through Montreal by reading on her iPod. Note that it's not an intrinsically digital phenomenon. It's a printed book epiphenomenon. But e-books, you might argue, are digital and offer great storage and distribution benefits. If e-books drove out printed books, according to this view, bookmobiles, instead of ferrying books between libraries could become libraries. They're big enough to house the servers required. But Google actually consumes as much energy as all the airlines of the USA combined. So Google Books, to give but one example, is not a benign exercise. Furthermore, reading an e-book on a tablet is, as the New York Times noted two days ago, like trying to cook with small children. (laughs) <laughs> a desperately distracted business <laughs> which takes me back to Kafka on the shore I downloaded it mainly because the audiobook for Wolf Hall is available from the library only in a format that will not download to a Mac had I been the proud owner of a Kindle and willing to buy the ebook version I still couldn't have gotten Hilary Mantel's novel from Amazon after all I'm Canadian Perhaps, when they clap us in copyright irons, Wolf Hall will become available 